Now, I'm Katie Gross. I am Chief Customer Officer of real-time market research platform, Suzy. And through our hybrid of Qual and Quant, we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands, helping them to identify more agile and iterative ways of connecting with their consumers. So I am very pleased to be joined on the virtual stage today by three absolute powerhouses, and I will allow them to introduce themselves. Hi, Elliot. Feel free to hey, introduce you, yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, cool. I was talking ahead of it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elliot Rosen. I am an acquisition marketing expert for Unilever in the new brand creation division of the beauty and personal care portfolio. Awesome. Meredith, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I am a senior manager at Duncan Business, and I uh, work on our consumer insight team, focused mostly on new product development. So I get the pleasure of inspiring ideas, optimizing our concepts, and then um, really helping to focus our new product innovations. Amazing. And last but not least, Abby. Hi, thanks for having me. Abby Finnis. I lead portfolio insights and analytics for the U.S. beverage business at PepsiCo. So that includes building and scaling new tools and capabilities across short-term business diagnostics, as well as all the way to foresights and future demand mapping. So happy to be here. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. So we're going to kick start. Um, and I'll start with you, Abby, actually. So if you could maybe explain to the audience how COVID-19 has impacted the insights function at PepsiCo. Yeah, just a little. Um, <laughs> no, it's 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 been quite the ride. Um, you know, I would say the impacts have really felt to me like a call to action to just accelerate everything about our our capability building agenda that we were already doing. So by that I mean bringing more speed, um, scaling consumer centricity across the organization, and it's become a huge platform really for that. So putting consumers first, um, a big part of that at PepsiCo, yes, is faster big data, faster DIY platforms, but also empathy and, and thicker data. So I would say the biggest change has really just been an acceleration and, and again, a, a bigger audience um, and call to action to, to ramp things up across all those. We're getting called to produce materials for meetings all the way up to our CEO on a regular cadence, just because there's the business reality, but really everyone wants to hear and understand the consumers at the core of that. And that's a lot of what we're we're building our outlook and, and understanding of the situation around. So it's been exciting. It's been exciting. Yeah. How is that playing out for you, Meredith? It, very similar to what Abby said. I mean, I think for sure we really want to understand the consumer and how trends are impacting the consumer um, from COVID, how their behaviors are changing, what their needs are. So um, we're certainly taking a look at that and we're relying a lot on our research partners to help us um, with that. And, and we're in charge of kind of translating what does it mean um, for Duncan customers. And certainly our leadership is um, very interested in that as well. But in addition to that, I think um, what it's really done is from a consumer insights point of view is it's, it's forced us to get really creative. Um, we're already a pretty creative bunch, but we do a lot of in-person research. It's, it's hard to do a taste test when you can't come into contact with consumers. So we've had to get pretty creative on some of our methodologies and some of our approaches. We've had to pause some of them until it was safe, um, but it's really focused us to, to get creative. And of course, um, faster is always better. So we've been pressured in terms of, of timing and turning things around very quickly. So we've leaned a lot on our research partners to help us with, with all of that. Yeah, I'm sure it's very similar for you. Um, at Unilever, Elliot, do you have anything else to add there? Um, they definitely nailed all of it. I was going to say <laughs> that I, I myself don't work on the insights team. I'm on a uh, new brand creation and kind of like more of the brand marketing side. And I've, when I've done so, they definitely don't envy a lot of people working in insights because the sheer volume of requests, I mean, it seems like they have to answer everything in a time where nobody has answers for anything. Um, so it's definitely been interesting to see the, the volume increase, but also I think uh, Meredith's comment about kind of making up methodologies on the fly, a lot of things are changing. And in order to be empathetic to a consumer, you're gonna have to try things a little bit different now. Something that I've been noticing a lot is like for the first time, 
in a long time, I guess it's kind of been equalized and we, we feel like we are a lot closer to the consumer than before. Um, I would say this is the first time that I, since I've been working in CPG where we're all in the same boat. So it's actually easier to kind of be empathetic and understand why certain changes are happening and why consumers' preferences are changing because, you know, I'm thinking of ordering my groceries as well or um, I'm experiencing the same shortages at Shelf. So, yeah, just to build off of that, it's like there's a mixture between uh, the empathy being a little bit easier to handle but also the sheer volume of requests causing me to get creative with the methodologies. I think those are the two biggest shifts. Yeah, that makes sense. And and Abby, you mentioned that you're getting, you know, ask for data from everything from sea level meetings and so on. So, and for all of you, how are you empowering people within your business to get closer to the insights? Maybe how, you know, if you could answer maybe how you're democratizing or sharing that data, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, we actually, because of, of that call to action and and we've got, gone ahead and launched a consumer centricity site at PBMA um, to actually do just that. It's actually stated as one of the objectives. So we have democratized, anyone with a PepsiCo email can find us on the internet and all of our content, our one-on-one -on -one discussions, the SUSE surveys we've done, everything is available on this site curated by topic. Because um, we actually address the marketing organization two to three times a month on different themes and we cover both the status of things as well as our outlook. Um, and it's funny, Elliot, you mentioned, um, you know, everyone wanting all of the answers. It's been an interesting shift. At first, I did feel that the organization wanted some assurance for me that I had a crystal ball. I think we've now <laughs> come around to the fact that there's no point in pretending that exists. But instead, let's just own what we can and collectively as a team build an, an empathy and an understanding for what everyone's going through, harnessing on our own experiences. So all of the content we curate with really that at the core we've made available, we also went so far as to democratize all of our traditionally marketing facing brand scorecards. So, so people could understand how our brands are shining and resonating in this environment with consumers. So our equity tracker, brand health measures are now available on that site, touching anyone in the organization who's curious, along with our, our media measures. So we've really gone and invested to democratize and bring the power of the organization together and putting people first. So that's really great to hear. Um, at Duncan, we were similar in that we had we are leveraging technology a lot. We also have an online kind of knowledge library. Um, it houses all of our third party research as well as competitive intelligence and many of our consumer insights um, reports. But in addition to that, one of the things that we've done is we took our consumer segmentation study that we developed recently and we tapped into Ask Susie to really help bring the consumer segmentation to life a little bit more. Um, data is great, but actually talking to the consumer and understanding a lot of the why behind the data is so important. And so we were able to leverage the focus group tool within Ask Suzy to bring those segments to life a little bit more. And then we identified key points in which our marketing team was using um, the consumer segmentation, like when they're developing new products, for instance, and saying, okay, when you're developing new products, who are you developing them for? Let's make sure that they, they we all have a conversation about who the target consumer is. Um, and we've evolved at that point to make sure that we're really targeting that consumer. They have a guide to kind of ask themselves the right questions around who should we be targeting. Um, and so we've been able to really help bring that to life and even, um, using the Ask Suzy tool, um, we were able to implement the segmentation into the tool so that we can identify who the consumer is throughout all of our surveys. So it's not just, um, you know, what is resonating, but it's who it's resonating with. So we're able to really leverage that, um, that tool. Yeah, that's a really important distinction of talking to your customers rather than just talking to a gen pop audience. If you're talking to everybody, you're talking to nobody is the, the phrase that I've learned over the last couple of weeks for sure. Okay. And last but not least, how is Unilever uh, democratizing and sharing data across the organization? So I think there's like a two stage process to this. I think the first thing is about 
um, democratizing access to all the reports and insights mm -hmm. and data that the insights team traditionally guarded before, but now having it open. But I think what happens is eventually you kind of get too much, it's like an overload. Um, and then there's a mixture between there's so much insights to dig through, but also more and more there's pressure to answer very specific questions within those. So I think the stage two past that is democratizing by arming other teams outside of traditionally insights or data driven teams to to go and you know get this insights of social. And I think that's like the benefit of a platform like Suzy <clears throat> is that it's not keeping everything within an insights team. You can just as easily have brand marketers going in and if they're able to, you know, understand basics of consumer research just to make sure they're not just asking blanket questions or doing calls that don't have any mm -hmm. structure. Um, they're able to go and get access to insights that are just as good as what has traditionally been guarded by other teams or other divisions within the organization. So I think that there's like this, this stage-wise process of socializing that data. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so in terms of, um, you know, your consumer, they've changed so much in the last five months. I would love to know what's the most interesting insight that you found out about your consumer over the past five months. Meredith, I'd love to kind of start with you. Sure. Um, one of the most interesting things that I think we've learned, and I, I'm sure everybody can relate to this, is that your daily routine has changed um, <laughs> because so many people are either working from home or um, having children who are virtually learning or um, working longer hours, potentially still going into work, but but working, you know, different shifts and whatnot. So people's schedules have changed. And because of that change, um, our consumers have changed their routine, which no big surprise when, when you really think about it. But my morning routine has completely been upended and, um, and many others have too. So we don't have that consumer going to the drive-thru to get their cup of coffee at 7 a.m. like we used to. They may be going a little bit later on in the day um, or at different hours. So we're seeing consumers come to us um, during different day parts. And so we've launched products like refreshers and matcha that are a little bit more focused on the afternoon. Um, and certainly our espresso relaunch came at a great time. So we were prepared to to hit, um, you know, again, a little bit later of a day part for consumers who may drink espresso a little bit later um, and then snacking too. So it's really been um, blurred lines in terms of when consumers are eating what and when consumers are drinking what, and we've had to adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what about for Pepsi? What's been the most interesting uh, shift you've seen in your consumers? I mean, there have been so many, but I, I think a powerful one is just the power of our core human need for comfort and how resourceful consumers are in the pursuit of that. Um, you know, and, and we've watched it change in organic settings from, you know, the heavy DIY um, moments of quarantine where everyone was making recipes from their youth um, and, and enjoying every minute of it, as well as devouring the snacks that resulted to, I mean, even still today, I think while people are, you know, embracing their new state of, of physical health and, and probably trying to shed some pounds, if you're anything like me, you know, we still are seeing those two sides. So it's, you know, still needing the comfort um, and trying to get back into some sense of, you know, routine to the extent you can. But that that core human drive is just, it's a powerful thing to watch. Mm -hmm. Completely stuck. That's still <laughs> all my words for my answer. Um, I was going to say the same thing. It's like comfort, feelings of normalcy, those kind of really dictate a lot of consumer behaviors and patterns. And I think in beauty and personal care, what we saw that's really, really interesting and I think will have long lasting effect is, you know, the world shuts down access to a lot of beauty services or uh, specialty retail where you might be buying a lot of these things go away. But people's desire to look good, feel confident, be comfortable, take care of themselves, those don't go anywhere fast. So whether it's like an uptick in at home nail care, through to hair care and doing treatments at home, all the way to kind of like the migration of services and treatments that were traditionally done at like specialty beauty salons for face, like, like facials or other treatments, 
have all been turned into kind of at home do it yourself products. And I think that are people going to end up cutting their own hair and doing their own nails forever? No, but definitely a huge percentage more um, than we're doing it before. Um, so that's been really, really interesting. I think the second kind of like funnier example that's outside of the organization that I always like to share is I know a number of people who do um, retail insights for a clothing and apparel. So across the board, and they said that like May and um, May and April were really funny because the this huge uptick in people buying t-shirts and tops, but there was like a drought in bottom wear and pant sales for those couple of months. And it's kind of funny to see that like, kind of at the same point where it's like, you're still doing retail therapy that look good and feel good when you're on the Zoom calls, but um, kind of have to keep your ear in the ground and see these types of things. Yep. Absolutely. As we all mentioned before this call, TMRE stage was normally when I put my favorite shoes on and now it's my favorite slippers <laughs> instead, <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Um, so how, obviously a lot is changing and you're using a lot of methodologies. Um, how is, how are you staying informed about the consumer? What are your kind of go-tos to, to stay up to speed with the consumers? Abby, let's start with you. Gosh, I would say, um, the most powerful thing probably is one, not, not questioning the basics, right? So we have an understanding of core human needs at Pepsi. We, we have a sense of what we anticipated coming. So not spending time there, but really looking for the acute impact or explanations of that we're able to observe. So I would say our go-tos are, we've made a real shift and are trying to do more to observing more real human, you know, settings. So, you know, social listening is part of that, but not all of it, certainly, because we know that's not our real selves, but um, doing a lot of empathy work. And then I would say channeling those and our pre-existing understanding of trends and then fielding, you know, Susie surveys, quick turn that you can get really granular in because I'm where my team sits in the organization. I need tools that my national brand marketers can use, but that also the marketers leading our division in the north that has, say, 15 metro areas to, to help understand what people are going through there. So really those forming hypotheses, ideally off the thicker human sources of information through videos, um, ethnography type work now that we're, we're back engaging in that type of thing. Um, all virtually, and then forming hypotheses to go round out with scale studies that I can, you know, push out to the organization to mine for their specific target. I would say we're doing we're doing a lot of that kind of hybrid type work we found mm -hmm. to to give us the most informed speed, um, if you will. We don't have time to do you know large scale segmentations or you know to really recast things every month when they're changing just so quickly. Yeah, and that's, I really like the phrase thicker insights. You've used that twice now, which is um, great. And bringing that hybrid of qual and quant into to one place. Obviously, Susie adapted pretty quickly by bringing a Susie Live tool to, to market. Meredith, you've mentioned that you're doing um, both face-to-face -face and online quals. So if you can maybe share with the audience how you've been conducting qual this year and, and your thoughts, that would be great. Sure. I think um, we've we've done it a few different ways. So obviously we're doing a lot virtually. And so we're leveraging a lot of our partners like Ask Susie to help us with those online focus groups. So important. Um, we have actually been able to um, do some dyads and triads live. Um, so we've had much smaller focus groups and um, put consumers into a room very socially distant. Um, and spoken with them and uh, we all wore masks and um, had a great conversation. I think people are eager to talk to others as long as they're in a comfortable, safe environment. So it's been great in terms of interacting with people. Um, I think, you know, two things. One is when you're wearing a mask as a consumer, um, it's actually helpful, I think, for the moderator because what I basically said to them was, I can't tell how you're reacting. So you're going to have to really tell me. Um, so it, it forces more of a conversation and less reading of the face, less reading of their um, their body reactions and really more dialogue. Um, similar with online focus groups. I think so many of us are used to now this, right? So we're all kind of used to Zoom. 
and many consumers are as well. So they're a lot more comfortable engaging in a platform like this. Um, I love doing this virtually because it enables you to speak with consumers across the US, um, even across the world potentially, but it really, um, it helps make sure that we're casting a wide net of consumers. And again, I, I think that the comfort level is just um, exceptional now that we're all a lot more used to to um, the Brady Bunch screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love your point that you made there that you can you cannot see their face anymore. So it's really down to them to, to really explain it to you. And I love that you're conducting research on social distancing whilst social distancing <laughs> in that room. <laughs> Elliot, how's uh, Unilever adapting to, to call capabilities in 2020? Well, I think it's imperative for us to get consumer feedback all the time, particularly because we're working in innovation and new brand creation, a lot of digitally native brands. So we actually have the opportunity instead of, let's say if we're going into like mass retail first, is we can put various types of stimuli or experiences in front of consumers and get feedback and have the opportunity to iterate on the fly. Mm -hmm. So that means everything from those very early days with concept designs um, to get a, a taste test to see which ideas are more popular than others, all the way through to like later things like website copy or ad experiences, etc. So we're just focusing on having this build, measure, learn loop mm -hmm. and how can we use platforms, processes, methodologies in order to go through it faster and optimize for an output that is learning. Um, so I think that in a way, what the pandemic has done is made us focus a lot more on digital, obviously. Um, but because of that, we've adopted processes that are probably a little bit more different than traditionally done at the corporation. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, so obviously for some of you, um, working in both food and drink and, and great time to be selling soap, <laughs> Elliot. Um, 2020 has been kind of a, an exponential growth year for some of you, but as we look to 2021, I'm sure your shareholders and uh, leadership teams are already putting you under pressure to maintain that growth or to have a bounce back year in 2021. Um, are you able to share any insights, Elliot, on how maybe Unilever is, is attempting to, to look at that recovery year? Oof. I think <laughs> it's, it's, di it's difficult because when you have a um, category like CBG or beauty that is doing really well throughout all of this, it's like, what are you looking at? What is a recovery year when you're doing really well? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not innovating, like you said, for the sake of getting out of the hole. It's how do you maintain the climb that we're currently on? And I think um, I think that's the big question. I don't, I don't know if there's a direct answer I can provide you on it, but it's definitely top of mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Abby, how, how is Pepsi looking at 2021 or is that something to think about next month? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, we certainly are talking about, it. I think the two biggest things, maybe three, um, the first probably just understanding new ways to drive trial. Um, mm -hmm. So with e-com penetration having gone where it has um, certainly that channel has a new importance. I think people have spent a lot of time, whether it's buying a lot of new t-shirts or, you know, exploring products online um, with all that growth. So rethinking how we launch a new product, how to generate and reach triers um, more efficiently is probably number one for our product innovation thinking. I think number two um, really is where, where we are doing well in our business. How do we how do we help our customers get back to doing well? So I would say now more than ever, the process of joint business planning, especially when you think about PepsiCo sells a lot of beverages in food service, um, you know, mm -hmm. dining and some of those channels, um, you know, airlines, uh, recreation, they're, they're, they're not having as easy easy of a time. And we genuinely, we are spending time figuring out how do we help lift them through these times and, and what are ways to delight our consumers and, and help them return and find growth. And the last thing I would just say is um, agility. So I, I have never talked so much about it, the need for agility, whether it's in my insights tools or in our brand plans um, as now. So as we look ahead, I think it's um, no region of the country is the same, no customers the same. And how do we just build and plan for that and lean into it for growth? So those are probably the three most talked about things. But yeah, I mean, it's a great, tough question. But. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I had a quote recently from a friend of mine who said he would kill to eat a steak in a city that is not his own, in a restaurant that's not his own, on a company credit card at some point. And yeah, that, I, I look forward to the return to airlines and, and food service. <laughs> Um, you mentioned agility, um, Abby, of course, what DIY platforms um, like Suzy help companies do is to, to get access to the consumer in a far quicker, more agile way. But what were your initial reactions to DIY and how has that changed this year? And maybe we'll start with you, Meredith. Yeah, I, um, I love DIY research. I, I always have. And maybe it's because I've worked in a lot of small organizations that have forced a lot of the more creative grassroots type um, you know, of approaches. And so I, I think um, this year, probably more than ever, we've relied a lot on DIY research because um, it really enables the research team to go directly to the consumer. It's that direct link to the consumer. So you're, yeah. you're almost cutting out that middleman and you're, you're making it um, more of a streamlined connection. And, you know, I think the, the, the research team within the organization knows the business really well and can easily ask the questions that need to be asked of the consumer. So um, it's just that direct connection. And it's not to say that you don't still rely on best in class vendors, because um, I certainly could not run a regression analysis or a cluster analysis or anything like that. I'd, I'd need to rely on um, a lot of my research partners to do something like that. But when we're able to use our skills and connect directly with the consumer, I just think it's so powerful um, because there is that direct link and um, you're having that that direct discussion and you're able to translate what the consumer is saying and make it actionable for, um, for the organization. So I love do-it-yourself research. Um, and I think it's, it's great that our company is really continuing to embrace um, do-it-yourself research when when able. Mm -hmm. That's great. Elliot, do you share that same love or was it a different a different path for you in 2020? Uh, no, I think they kind of nailed everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't have any additional comments on that. <laughs> great. And Abby, what about uh, Pepsi? How How's Pepsi embracing DIY research in 2020? They, I mean, they love it. It was, it's, I mean, I've been doing insights for 20 years, so I'll admit that I grew up loving a good old paper survey, programming, mm -hmm. playing around in Quanvert, you know, going through paper <laughs> tables. I mean, so it, it's been a longer road for me, <laughs> thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a great team and I would say, thank goodness we were on the path to adopting and really embedding it before COVID. And I now there's just no looking back. I mean, honestly, and I think that's what I loved about, you know, meeting Susie was you made it approachable and worked with us. Um, mm -hmm. So and and all of the needs that that we brought to, to fielding work and helping bridge what we had been doing to to what we needed to do now. So I think, again, there's just no going back and the need for speed, agility, and just control. I mean, the amount of time it would have taken to have briefed and reviewed a survey versus having the team do it and, and just feeling empowered. Um, we actually just fielded one before this call because we needed some <laughs> data for something in, <laughs> on Wednesday. So, um, you know, just that power, it, it, I, I don't see another, another way. So it's been a real, I think, sense of empowerment for us and has helped us rise to the occasion of putting the consumer first and having a handle and an, a framework and a story from our consumers of what's going on. So no looking back for me, but I will admit mm -hmm. for any participants on here that having been in the industry for a long time, um, it was a bit harder for me to let go of some of the complexity, but I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, it's a, you know, if same for consumers, right? Our habits have changed and we will likely never go back to what we were doing before. It's the same with research methodologies. It's been, you know, it's sped up what, what was going to be the inevitable in certain yeah. cases. We're getting some questions from the audience. Um, so we have about five minutes left. So we certainly want to address um, some of these questions. So one of the, those questions um, is uh, Thomas Fuller. And I know that um, you'll have an answer for this, Abby, and that your company's launched a product related to this. But how ha have you been studying the impact of sleep patterns and the impact of caffeine, snacks, et cetera? And I know that Pepsi obviously launched um, a, a Driftwell product recently for, for sleeping. So... Are you guys studying the change in sleep patterns? 
I think our scientists, so at, at R&D, have always spent a lot of time um, understanding ingredients and their relationship to um, the human body and, and um, routine. But I think what what we've been paying um, a lot of attention to is are things more that consumers talk about. So drift well, if you read about it, um, is is really about relaxation. And I think whether you're sleeping or not, um, I don't think many are relating to feeling constantly relaxed. So, <laughs> um, so we we spend a lot of time trying to understand what relaxation and and what stress and the absence mm-hmm. of relaxation and also the absence of moments of transition throughout the day, probably more than we have sleep, just because we have an easier time um, speaking, watching, um, relating, relating to that. Um, but we, we do. And, and those are those are the unlocks where we can help alleviate, hopefully, some some tensions and, and make people's lives better. But the sleep study, I think we leave to our scientists, the um, stress, anxiety, moments of transition we've been spending a lot of time with consumers on. And I, I don't know if everyone knew this, but grinding teeth has become, if you've seen that in the press recently, it was in, has become a, a much more pronounced problem, um, which I, I guess would be a not so restful sleep, but I think more the result of all the anxiety that we're feeling. I had read that as well, Abby, and it's it's fascinating to me too, because one of the things that I've noticed or in the data is that with Gen Z and millennials um, in particular, the level of anxiety and the need for relaxation is actually higher than any other generation. So um, I think you're really targeting that that younger consumer who does need to relax, but also in turn needs that boost of energy. So um, we kind of have both needs um, that I would say, you know, we're probably both looking at. Um, and it's it's interesting that the need for energy, um, and I think it's, you know, energy can be defined in so many different ways um, at Duncan. Certainly we look at caffeine and energy and getting your morning started, but it's also about that afternoon pick me up. It's also about um, being alert and focused and making sure that you're getting through eight hours of Zoom calls or nine hours of Zoom calls. And um, you're also able to juggle um, virtual learning for your children while you're working. So I, I think that um, consumers are certainly faced with with more on their plate now and um, they need to de-stress, but also have the energy to get through the day. So, yeah. Just a few quick fire questions also. So uh, when conducting quantitative studies, are you using any AI for analysis? Is natural language processing embedded in your insights programs already? Anybody want to take that answer? I mean, we're we're exploring that at PepsiCo. Um, on and I don't I don't know that anything's launched at scale, but it's it's been explored in many fronts. Um, yeah. yeah, I would okay. say I would say insights is is difficult. There's a lot of people playing in this space um, mm-hmm. right now, but insight is particularly difficult to automate. Um, it's still very much a human art. Mm-hmm. I think mixed with science, so it's it's a bit difficult to kind of get it down to let's just run all of this data through natural language processing, and that's going to produce an answer. It's a very technocratic way of looking at it. When, um, especially if your scale is a bit smaller and you're not quite operating at a big data analysis, a lot of these consumer segments and, and trends that are popping up, you're not going to have you know tens of trillions of data points to go through. You're looking at a much smaller amount of data to wade through mm-hmm. yeah, so i think it's definitely on the roadmap um but i don't think that it's like a panacea it's all the questions you need to have answered is, is relying on ai and nlp to figure that out mm-hmm. that's a great point all right we are out of time this has been absolutely fascinating thank you so much to the panel for joining me and thank you to the participants for asking questions in the chat function thanks everybody thank, thank you, you. bye